Coming up on This Week in Computer Hardware, sweet system builds like $600 gaming desktops, Huawei's sub-3-pound gaming laptop, Intel's new $3,000 28-core CPU, and so much more. All coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 502, recorded on January 31st, 2019. $3,000 CPUs and OLED PSU. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by OnDeck. Are you a small business owner in need of capital today? Well, OnDeck can help. With over $10 billion in loans and an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau, OnDeck is a lender you can trust. Find out more at ondeck.com slash twitch. And by Hover. Register a domain name and build your online brand with Hover. Visit hover.com slash twit to get 10% off your first purchase of any domain extension for the entire first year. Welcome to Twitch. This week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most delightful, most engaging, most peculiar, most informative, most internet of stuff, most desktop, most mobile, most, well, mostly we're going to bring you Sebastian Peak. Hey, Sebastian. Hey, Patrick. <laughs> He's like, what is up with that introduction? I'm Patty Norton. Uh, it was quite the have, intro. You know, it's it was just a little off. It's kind of like watching somebody almost make the turn in the giant slalom before they just yard sale and cartwheel starfish down the slope. Um, it's a, it's you know a lot of business news this week. We'll we'll beat through pretty fast, but I was really excited looking at. You know, I'm always excited to look at PCPro.com slash leaderboard. You guys did an article talking about uh, tech reports, system build upgrades. And I just want to say it's a great time to be a PC gamer. <laughs> the longer yes. 1080p monitors remain the standard. <laughs> and they are, Performance of course, just gets better. standard, yeah. And the the Econobox Gamer, I think, was the one that, that Jeremy called out there. Their 600-ish dollar build which is powered by a Ryzen 5 2600 and it's it's got 8 gigabytes of DDR4 3200 memory which is coming down it's always nice to see RAM prices come back down to earth and you know you have an RX 570 discrete graphics solution in there you go a little bit higher with the graphics if you've got the budget for it go get like a 580 with more memory but you know, this even has, and the wonderful thing to me about this is that we're in the era where an Econo box gaming system can have an SSD, and not just right. not just like a 64 or 128 to throw one in there for the OS boot. We're talking about a 500 gigabyte SSD that's under seventy dollars. So, right, yeah, and the this you know the at six hundred and twenty four dollars, um. You know, you're talking about, again, 8 gigabytes of RAM, which is more than enough for most games. A Ryzen 5 2600, which is a really sweet part for the money. Uh, and then uh, an RX 570, it's $149. And it's going to, you know, I'm really curious to see what NVIDIA drops at that, that end of the price, uh, the price range. Uh, you know, I feel, I feel um, you know, it feels like, you know, it may be, you know, a 2050, it may be a 1066, it may be a 1600, whatever crazy numbering scheme uh, is the flavor of the week in the rumor mill. But this is just a fantastic time to be building a system. And, you know, I got to say, I'm with you. The Econobox, just building that with the onboard graphics and just waiting for that next round of GPUs to hit from NVIDIA and AMD, you know, if you're desperate for a new gaming machine, that is a fantastic way to roll. Um, I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's even before the Ryzen 3000 parts show up at the high end. Um, I mean, I was, I was thinking about that cause uh, you know, I, I was, I was talking to a friend a couple of weeks ago and, and you know, they were kind of like, well, you know, that single core performance on Intel. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, I'm, I'm rendering, I'm thinking about rendering at a machine at the office, um, using handbrake versus rendering at home and because they have so many more cores on the the ryzen 1800x you know it decreases the render time by almost i want to say i'm, I'm rendering 150 percent faster um and these were similarly yeah. priced parts you know ab about a year apart year and a half apart so it's uh i understand intel king of single core performance you know some of their new processors are amazing but the ryzen's man 
They're all over PC Pro's leaderboard. They're all over Tech Report. It's really impressive when you start realizing somebody that, you know, two years ago, we were like, yeah, yeah, they make processors for consoles. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> And, and laptops yeah. that nobody wants to buy. Um, and it's it's important, too, that not only do we have more affordable memory, but fast memory, because yeah. especially if you're going with that that integrated solution, like uh, one of the G-series parts that, like one of their APUs to, to hold you over until that next graphics card, because those mm -hmm. love fast memory. And we've gone from kind of like 2400 DDR4 being pretty much the affordable standard uh, a slight jump up from 2133, but then 2666, and then all the way up to like 3200 now have become very affordable. And the more memory bandwidth you throw at an APU, the happier you'll be. It significantly affects frame rates. That's uh, a good thing to remember. I was uh, horrified to discover. I just went to double check to see what the latest RAM prices were on Camel, Camel, Camel. Uh, and my, you know, Jesus wept. Um, they had a three-disc failure. They were set up for two-disc redundancy, had three-disc fail, and it pretty much wiped out their server, so they're not going to be back online. Uh, this happened Saturday, January 26th. They'll be back up online uh, at the beginning of February, uh, Saturday, February 22nd. Excuse me, Saturday, Whoa. February 2nd. Oh, okay. Um, That's a little bit more reasonable. Yeah. So, you know, uh, this is like, you know, you, you think your NAS was expensive. Um New disks, fourteen thousand eight hundred sixty dollars and seventy nine cents. Due to the shared age of the failed and remaining disks, we were replacing all twelve of the disks plus two spares, not just those that failed. That's fourteen Samsung eight sixty Pro four terabyte drives plus a new RAID card. The data recovery is costing them twenty nine thousand seven hundred and twenty six dollars. So if you'd care to donate via PayPal, they have a button. They say we don't expect our users to cover these bills, but we do appreciate any and all help with them. Um, ouch. That's a hefty data recovery bill. So remember, kids, back up. And apparently use triple disk redundancy. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> but when those raid cards go, man, they will take everything with them. So the house, the neighborhood, the city. Uh, I, the, yeah, the, there's been... We don't get too deep into the business here, except that it's important to pay attention to when businesses are having good times or bad times, because that can cause, uh, for example, uh, you know, Intel as I think rapidly changing its pricing uh, and working a lot more on desktop processors because AMD came out of nowhere and dropped an incredibly competitive product, and all of a sudden AMD started caring about power users again. Um, we've heard a lot of noise about uh, flagship sales uh, or flagship. Uh, phone sales being down, that Apple was was way down in terms of, of uh, their sales. I bring that up because uh, they talked about the first quarter results and their earnings per share is like $4.18, which is the highest it's ever been. And kind of the big takeaway, uh, the, the thing that kind of stuck with me was, you know, hey, you know, sales are down on iPhones 15% uh, year over year. Quote, total revenue from all of their products and services grew 19%. And, uh, you know, services alone was like $10.9 billion. Um, you know, Mac, wearables, home accessories grew like 9 uh, and 13, like 9% on one hand on the Mac and wearables. I think 33% on home and accessories. iPad revenue grew 17%. Um, so I guess they're... They're making something in the neighborhood of uh, $19.7 billion um, <laughs> after iPhone sales went down 15%. So yeah, they're doing, they're doing okay. They're doing okay. And you Not know, maybe so iPhone okay. sales, Oops, go maybe, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, you got it. I was going to say, maybe iPhone sales are not as high as they have been, but they've got a lot of other products. They've got obviously iPad, they've got the Apple Watch, they have Apple Music which probably fits into that services category. So <laughs> nothing to worry about there. And they have uh, uh, just a little bit of money in the bank too. A smidge. Like like I well mean, over $200 billion in the bank. But you know. Yeah. <laughs> that was, that's still a mind-boggling. Just mind cash. Yeah, cash, cash on hand. Yeah. Well, that was it's also, like I mean, everybody, everybody thought that Nintendo was going to be in trouble before the Switch came out. And there was a lot of articles that were like, yeah, they've got, 
enough money to cover their current costs for 46 years. So presumably, <laughs> <laughs> they would be able to hold on. Um, not holding on. Uh, so Foxconn was going to build this $10 billion plant in Wisconsin. Um, yes. 13,000 workers, huge manufacturing facility, and things have changed. Uh, Reuters did a big article on this. It's more like 1,000 workers maybe by 2020, not 13,000. Um, and it's going to be uh, research and design, uh, engineering, not manufacturing. Um, there's not a lot of discussion on the $4 billion in tax breaks uh, that were promised by the state of Wisconsin. Uh, and, and you know, I, I, let me point this out. I, I find, you know, stadiums holding uh, cities hostage to keep the teams in town uh, kind of abysmal. So, you know, I, I, I love the fact that the Wisconsin budget product, uh, budget project, the Wisconsin budget project did the math and said it would take 25 years to recoup uh, that $4 billion in tax breaks. And that was with the 13,000 jobs and the full manufacturing facilities. Uh, meetings are coming, though. We know that Foxconn missed out on $9.5 million in tax breaks in 2018 because they only hired 178 people rather than the targeted 260. Now, whether that's because of all the changes in what they're planning on doing in Wisconsin or if that's because you know everybody knew it was going to be the coldest winter ever in history uh, in Wisconsin uh, or just cold as, as hell. And if you're suffering through that right now, please stay warm. Um, a friend of mine who's not enjoying negative 27 in uh, in Minnesota, but uh, you know it's it's interesting to see you know how these plans change. Uh, you know it's also because Foxconn is also talking about building iPhones in India, which would also, amongst other things, I think help them get around trade tariffs. And also they're running out of uh, seems to be they're running out of labor pool in China, which is just a mind boggling thing to consider. Uh, meanwhile, Intel is getting a billion dollars from Israel. They're expanding the plant there. Uh, they're going to add another 1,000 employees. There's already 13,000 employees at their existing plant in Israel. Uh, quote, last month, Intel said it had begun plans for site expansion projects in Ireland, Israel, and at its U.S. plant in Oregon starting in 2019. Um, so they're also looking to kind of diversify things and, and of course, as we've you know come to expect, uh, make lots of noises about you know automated cars and other 21st, 22nd century technologies. But... Uh, uh, it's also interesting that, that, you know, NVIDIA owned up to the fact that GPU sales last year may have been influenced, you know, we, we talked about this earlier, but just, you know, NVIDIA just a little bit, a smidge by the Bitcoin craze, um, cryptocurrency, cause they had flat out like, no, 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 no. <laughs> These are all natural sales. A lot of people running premier and a lot of gamers this year, um, but uh, they uh, adjusted their expectations. Um, AMD had cut their Q1 outlook, uh, a quote, amid lower graphic processor demand. Um, so uh, inventory and the end of the blockchain boom were the issues. And there's a lot of inventory. They built a lot of cards for as long as everybody was buying every card they could manufacture. And I think they were still building as many cards as they could when people stopped buying the cards and then started throwing the cards up on eBay and Craigslist. So if, you know, if you're brave enough to buy a used card, it's going to be a really good time to buy a used card. Uh, but uh, other than that, uh, they're doing pretty good financially. And uh, yeah, they made that money. Kinda... That was the big thing. Last yeah. year, they, they had revenue was up. But last year they had, you know, revenue of five and a quarter billion dollars and they lost thirty three million dollars. This year, revenue was up so, six and a half and they made three hundred and thirty seven million dollars. So it's a huge turnaround from year to year to go from negative to three hundred plus million dollars in profit. So it's been a good year. <laughs> very, it's very good, good year for them. And we haven't even seen the Radeon 7 yet. Um, Bob Swan, this actually just popped up a few hours ago. Uh, Bob Swan, or Robert Swan, I should say, Mr. Swan is probably what I should say. He's been named the permanent CEO over at Intel. Uh, he's been the interim CEO for the last, uh, I guess, seven months. He was the CFO over at Intel since 2016. Uh, he's now been elected to the company's board of directors. So um, I thought it was interesting that the stock kind of slid and I don't know if that is because they wanted, you know, some kind of super awesome tech genius, uh, uh, you know, engineering kind of person. But this is a 
He's a financial guy. He's been riding the ship. He's been kind of, you know, holding steady after Brian Krasanich left uh, suddenly uh, for what has been called a consensual relationship with an employee, which is in gross violation of Intel's, I guess, internal rules. Not that I know them particularly well. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, apparently, uh, apparently Mr. Swan has decided that he really, you know, he really loves Intel. He's always loved doing the financial stuff, but he, he really loves Intel. And this makes him Intel's seventh CEO in the 50 years the company's been running. So, yeah, I don't think it, I mean, it's never that exciting when the person who's been sort of running things takes over full time, perhaps and the stock right. could slide up on this news. Like what were they expecting the, with the rumors about? Lisa Sue from AMD coming over. Mm -hmm. I, I guess maybe some people took that seriously. I think she's happy where she is, but yeah. You know. I think the last time people got excited about an interim CEO lo losing the interim title was uh, someone named Steve Jobs. So <laughs> it's been a few years. People are like, yeah, he's the CEO. They're like, you uh -huh. kind of knew that was coming, though. Just a little bit. Um, we should probably take a moment. Uh, uh, we should probably take a moment to thank one of our sponsors. But before we do that, do you want to do kind of a, a, a recap, a summary of the Radeon 7 rumors that has started bubbling up on, on Twitter this week? Sure. Um, it, and this is that same, uh, I guess you could call him like a data miner. Uh, he's a serial leaker on Twitter who goes by Appisac, I guess, A-P-I-S-A-K. And... He's he's releasing like graphic scores for like three D Mark benchmarks like Time Spy and Fire Strike and stuff, giving you an idea of what the card can do. And you know, we we've seen additional benchmark leaks for this thing. We haven't really heard anything new though. Like nothing in the last week is, is like new and notable as far as uh like the rumors about this, which you know, we, we got basic specs at CES. We've already heard right. what the card is, what, you know, we know how much memory it has. Some things were clarified as far as, you know, the the platform, exactly what, uh, like, the intent of this product is, which sounds like it's going to be more of, like, a mix between, like, compute and just raw gaming performance, especially with all that memory on board. And then some of the other memory, uh, some of the other rumors we're surrounding like whether or not AMD can even make money with this card. Like uh, some people are claiming that they they know that there's no way that they're making anything where the, they think that the total costs are like seven hundred dollars, which, you know, that's their MSRP for the cards. So that seems unlikely. It, it <laughs> does seem likely that 16 gigabytes of HBM2 is not inexpensive, but we will have to see where it actually stands. The performance that we've seen so far, like you can measure these numbers against what's out there and they're good numbers so it's mm -hmm. like what you know this is beating a rtx 2080 at times according to these leaks so which is you know it's more aggressive than they were they seem to downplay performance a bit they weren't releasing performance numbers against the competition at ces they were just kind of showing like well relative to <laughs> the mega 64 which is the previous card we're like 20 30 percent ahead which is good but if you like even when i was Looking at the RTX 2060 over the last couple of weeks, you know the the performance of that card eclipses a Vega 64. So you would hope right. to see some big gains. <laughs> and it's another generation. This is, but it's exciting. Like since this is seven nanometer. There's there's potential. But you know, with a process jump, you can make decisions about that. It doesn't just immediately result in, you know, just because it's a reduced die size doesn't I mean you're going to immediately have tremendously reduced power consumption and higher clocks and everything else that you want very often especially with a new process they're they're refining things and they're making choices like is this going to be can we push clocks higher now that we have more overhead because of the smaller node or are we going to really optimize on power so if this was a mobile product they'd obviously be, be looking at uh, power optimization with the same performance envelope but now they're they're looking at, I'm sure, greater performance. So, you know, the, some of the things that were clarified in the last couple of weeks with interviews with uh, different people at the company were things like, you know, what is the total power? They already said this is 300 watts. That's about the same as a Vega 64 part. So, I mean, no real change there. But 
uh, we would expect higher performance, probably higher clocks, if if right. if that's where they're going with the new process. So we'll have to see. It, you know, I've, as always with any you know rumors, take it with a grain of salt. Episac seems to have a pretty good track record so far. Although I will I find some of the console, the upcoming console leaks, a little hard to believe, but we'll see. That could be where all that money came from. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's true. I mean, I don't think everyone realizes AMD. You know, they make a lot of money on console. They are they're powering yeah. everything. They have, well, they're powering PlayStation and Xbox. Obviously, yeah. uh, Nintendo is using an Nvidia platform for their Switch, which is essentially like a supercharged tablet device that clocks up when it's that's in the stock. A, but that's a Tegra X one. I, 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 I'm trying to make sure the boys don't know that the Switch actually existed for a little while longer. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. You have yeah, headphones on, hear. it's okay, they can't hear. Oh my goodness. Hey, we should take a moment to thank our sponsor. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware, brought to you by On Deck. On Deck is 100% committed to small business owners with fast, easy, tailored financing. Your time is valuable, right? Imagine getting funding as fast as 24 hours, term loans up to a half a million dollars, lines of credit up to $100,000, none of which require business collateral. The application process is simple. You can apply online or by phone and get approved in minutes. It won't impact your personal credit. On Deck delivers some of the best customer service with their U.S.-based loan specialists. They have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. And they're big. They've lent over $10 billion to over 80,000 small business owners. And they carry a 9.8 out of 10 rating on Trustpilot. On Deck is the secure financing service that business owners everywhere can truly rely on. If you're a small business owner and need access to capital, go to ondeck.com slash twitch right now. And as a listener of This Week in Computer Hardware, you'll receive a free consultation with one of their U.S.-based loan specialists. Apply online or by phone and get approved in minutes. Go to ondeck.com slash twitch. That's O-N-D-E-C-K dot com slash T-W-I-C-H for your free consultation now. We want to thank OnDeck for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. The, uh, possibly my favorite title in approximately forever was up on the register.co.uk. Uh, disk drives suck less than they did a couple of years ago, which is nice. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're cheeky over there with their titles. Cheeky is an excellent word. Um, you know, the short wrap is, is, uh, Backblaze released one of their studies and, uh, failure rates are down for the super high capacity drives, which is always a dangerous place um, as they start really, 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 really up in the aerial density. So they, uh, Backblaze has uh, 10,000 12 terabyte Seagate drives, um, just 139 out of those 10,000 12 terabyte Seagate drives failed uh, in a year. Western Digital's HDST brand has an even better rate, 51 drives out of 10,000. Um, and, you know, in case you're wondering, if you're not familiar with it, Backblaze does a report fairly regularly on the kind of the state of the drives in their collection. They use uh, more towards the consumer side on drives in many cases rather than enterprise class stuff. They have 104,778 drives in their data center. Um, you know, uh, this is not their most extensive study. Um, the register notes, quote, the firm listed just four brands in its estate with models ranging from older ones with three terabytes of capacity to newer 12 terabyte drives and some 14 terabyte drives from Toshiba. Um, and it's really crazy, right? 31,146 12 terabyte Seagate disks, uh, another 1300, well, 1278 uh, 12 terabyte uh, HG STs. Yeah, look at that. Uh, that. That 12 terabyte HGST drive, one failure out of almost 1,300 drives. Yeah. In 71,000 drive days. It's very, <laughs> very low. And there was a Toshiba, the 5 terabyte uh, Toshiba, let's see, 16,335 drive days. 45 yeah. drives, very small sample size, but zero failures so far. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty crazy when you start looking at this. Um, the 4 terabyte Seagate ST400 DM000. Now, that failure, you know, they were all the way up there at 2.13% annual failure rate. They had 581 drives fail. 
but that's 581 out of 23,236. That's 9,961,154 drive days. They just yeah. they have massive amounts of data on drives that just always kind of fascinates me to look at. And uh, it's good to see failure yeah. rates going down. I don't think I've ever seen this report where there was a drive that had just zero failures. It is a very or small, especially scene. that twelve terabyte at just <laughs> one failure. That's crazy. Yeah, that's uh, that's amazing. Um. Yeah, I could stare here and go um and read specs for a long time, but technically we do have to talk on the podcast. The uh, Anyhow, heads up if you're kind of curious how how uh, the higher capacity drives are doing. I think the answer would be quite well. Thank you very much. Um, I got uh, to pick up – we shot a couple episodes before Shannon uh, went to New Zealand for a Linux conference, which is where she is right now. And uh, – the Huawei Matebook 13 arrived literally as she was leaving, so we wanted to get that in close to the release date. And so the Huawei Matebook Pro uh, had some pretty, 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 pretty excited reviews last year. Pretty people were pretty stoked about it. Um, you know, this one uh, is a similar kind of performance laptop going for the XPS 13, Apple's MacBook Air. Uh, and also, I, I would definitely poke it up against Razer's uh, Blade Stealth. And, uh, you know, this is... I want to say a 2.82 pound, a sub three pound laptop with uh, discrete MX150 graphics. And I want to note that it's the 25 watt TDP version of that MX150, not the 10 watt version. Uh, the 10 watt being notorious for having miserable performance. Um, you know, the uh, uh, Core i7-8565U uh, along with that uh, MX150. I was kind of fascinated by this. They also do a Core i5 version uh, that skips the discrete NVIDIA graphics um, and saves you a little bit of money. Uh, 3x2, Surface Book style, so 2160 by 1440 which gives it a considerably higher pixel count than the Razer Blade Stealth, which will be important in a minute. I got to say, uh, I actually do really like, I mean, I prefer to have a big, wide 38-inch ultra-wide desktop monitor like I have on my desk. It is incredibly impractical at a laptop, especially a 13.3-inch laptop. But I will say, 3x2, uh, you know, I'm always questing for wider laptops on my desktop, but that 3x2 perspective is actually incredibly useful. If you are always, if you want to read more before scrolling, if you want to see larger block of text, uh, text uh, whether you're emailing or, or in docs, if you are looking to have more rows uh, rather than columns exposed on your spreadsheet, uh, it's incredibly useful. The panel looked really, really good. Um, the panel, I don't think, is as bright as it could be. Now, there's a couple of possibilities. Some people are suggesting that the uh, it's a little too sensitive. It turns the brightness down uh, a little too much in response to the room. Uh, I've also, you know, it's only a 300-nit panel, and at least one measurement I saw had it closer to 250 nits. Um, it did seem less bright than other 300 nit uh, laptops I've used and especially when you get into some of the premium laptops that are running close to 400 nits um, that this particular laptop in a room with bright windows it was a little problematic to use because I couldn't get enough light out of the screen and also the screen is very very reflective it's not a matte screen so it's a very shiny screen uh, touch screen that's kind of reflective fans pick up a little bit when running stuff like handbrake which of course saturates all the cores um, I'm actually okay with that they weren't as gigantic you know jet taking off loud as I've seen on a lot of dedicated gaming laptops and quite frankly having used a you know a three thousand dollar surface book um, that performance went like this as the processor almost instantaneously became heat saturated and throttled down I am okay with with well designed uh, cooling solutions. Um, how is input uh, fairly thin? Like, how, like to me, the the big th the big three things with any notebook, and, and I know performance matters, but how does the display look? We've talked about that. What about the trackpad and keyboard? I really like the keyboard. Um, not as good as a Lenovo, but then again, almost nothing is. Um, certainly competitive with a lot of the stuff we've seen from Dell and HP. Okay. Um, fairly solid like good key travel good feel uh trackpad wasn't my favorite um it's a little odd because it's it's a slightly different color from the rest of the laptop it felt a little cheap it felt a little plasticky um i'm also a little nervous about kind of you know <laughs> once you get past like lenovo and dell and hp uh i've 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 had some truly mixed results with trackpad survival um but the keyboard felt excellent um the trackpad felt good, and as you can see, uh, you know, 
with non-taxing games, you could definitely get your 3D gaming on. Um, the biggest challenge for me wasn't the keyboard. Again, I wasn't a big fan of the, the trackpad. It was usable. It wasn't great. Um, and it seemed to be, you seemed to have to shove really, really far out to the right or left to, to get the left or right click out of the trackpad. Um, okay. Battery life was kind of atrocious. Um, now, a lot of ultra portables, a lot of smaller laptops, you know, you're not getting a 25 hour battery life out of these. You're not getting a 12 hours of battery life. It's rated for like 9.6 hours, uh, you know, just doing a straight, we're playing Netflix kind of experience. Um, I would put that between seven and eight hours. Um, if you were getting aggressive, doing a lot of computing or playing video games, it's going to drop uh, quickly. Video games are pretty taxing on the whole operation. I, you know, I feel like they could have gone a little bit bigger. It's a 41 watt hour battery inside of there. Uh, the Stealth is going to give you like 25% more battery life because it's got a much bigger battery. Um, you know, the uh, yeah, for me, the battery life was a bit of a challenge along with the trackpad. Um, the other thing is is your they, they don't have a lot of options on this. There's basically two models. There's the Core i5 version. There's the Core i7 version with discrete graphics. They both come with NVMe hard drives, but they're 512 uh, gigabyte NVMe hard drives, and they're soldered to the motherboard. So oh, having okay. the memory soldered to the motherboard, extremely common in Ultrabooks because there's so little Z inside of those. Having the, the drive soldered to the motherboard means you are done. Um, and that, you know... That kind of, you know, I would have liked to have seen 16 gigabyte options. I would have liked to have seen one terabyte or larger options. Uh, I, I, I know, obviously, because I work with a lot of video, I'm a little more, you know, or I like to carry around my entire music library. I'm a little more sensitive uh, to having a, a large capacity drive. Uh, you know, and there's a reason why I have so many SanDisk UltraFit drives in my life. Because, hey, look, kids, it's 256 gigabytes right there. Or, well, in this case, 128. The other one's 256. Um but, you know, that's there's not a lot of upgradability on this. They kept it really simple with the SKUs. There's two. Um, but, uh, you know, the that that I was a little kind of like, okay, 8 gigabytes is great. I'm glad they're not operating. Because my, my least favorite thing with laptops right now is seeing like, oh, we have a $700 model. Well, it's got 4 gigabytes of RAM, which makes it really crappy to use on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know. And I think for the vast majority of people buying laptops, eight gigabytes is more than enough. Uh, but again, uh, to be able to expand storage, oh, there's that trackpad again if you're watching the video. The ability to expand storage would be nice. Um, speakers are mounted underneath. Uh, they've got some Atmos running. They had some very big feet on it, which makes the notebook look much fatter than it actually is. But I also think it helps with the audio dispersion uh, and uh, cooling. Um, well, if it's on a desk, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If don't, it's on a pillow, don't put it on your lap and expect uh, that you know, feet, great audio performance when it's down firing like that. No, and I'll be honest with you, with down firing speakers, period, don't expect great audio performance. There was definitely audio. Uh, it was not my okay, favorite yeah. part of the um, As long as you can see your sound. Sometimes those Ultrabooks have very... Yes. I had a ThinkPad Yoga, the first generation. <laughs> not very good audio. I mean, it, it kind of like went out the back and bounced off the bottom of the uh, yeah. lid. <laughs> <laughs> get to you but it was i would say somewhere south of one watt perhaps right. half a watt it was not loud it was like a pair turning up a pair of headphones yeah that's always awkward when the 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 sound is teeny tiny and facing away from you and trying to get through the laptop um they uh it's interesting the closest competitor to this uh is well the the primary competitor to this would be the razor blade stealth um the version with discrete GPU on that one, the same MX150, uh, is $1,600. Again, just under three pounds. Uh, I think the Stealth is a half inch wider than the Matebook. Um, but it only has a 1080p screen, which means you're getting about 10% higher performance on games. Uh, it also has upgradable storage and a significantly like 25% larger battery. And, of course, the fantastic Quartz Pink option, which I'm really actually kind of in love with. You know, just, um, just in time for I remember how people. Day. Well, people used to like freak out because I had a pink, um, you know, life proof uh, iPhone cover. So, you know, I'm imagining me rolling into the coffee shop with my fantastic pink gaming laptop and watching people just bug out. Um, but, uh, you know, it was it's an interesting product. Um, and it's interesting to read some of the other reviews on it because people are either super enthusiastic about it or super mad about it. Um, I'm kind of excited, you know, and again, you know, you're looking at like medium settings on on 
uh, you know, if, if you're a video gamer, right, you're you're looking at sort of medium settings, medium light settings with Rocket League. Um, Fortnite's going to be playable, but you're going to have to turn the settings down to medium, absolutely. Um, and, it, you know, you're not playing either of those games with, with the Intel 620 uh, graphics or, you know, the, the onboard graphics on Whiskey Lake are not going to do 3D gaming, period. Um, and this one's interesting because that 21 by 60 by 1440 screen packs 50% more pixels than a 1080p screen. So that's a lot of work for an MX 150. That's roughly the equivalent of a GTX 1030, which is not, you may remember, a particularly powerful GPU. Um, but, uh, you know, any kind of demanding 3d video game something that's beyond fortnite something that's beyond rocket league something that's super graphics heady you're probably going to be turning the settings down to low but then again your option is probably to get like a big fat five pound gaming laptop or to not do your video gaming when you travel um so it's it's something to think about you know i i i, I want more memory options i want the drive to be expandable uh, I oh and i forgot the one thing the other the one other thing that drove me nuts uh Two USB ports and a headphone jack, or two USB C ports and a headphone jack. No Thunderbolt 3, which doesn't particularly bother me, but the left USB uh, USB C jack does power and data transfer. The right USB C jack does display link and data transfer, which means you can't do a single cable connection from a monitor to power your laptop and run the video off. So you're going to be running at least two cables off of the laptop if you want to get your. Uh, or, you know, going to a docking solution. Uh, I found that a little frustrating. It didn't make sense to me. Um, but uh, I'm also not the engineers that put this together. So, you know, I'm... If you want a game and you want to travel with a light laptop, I think this is a fantastic option. Uh, if you are a power user that needs storage and memory, this is not your option, uh, unless you can be satisfied with a half a terabyte and eight gigs, uh, which if you're, you know, if you're a certain kind of programmer or something, it's just not going to cut it. Um, build quality was decent. Battery life, uh, if you spend a lot of time on planes and you, you need all the battery life, this is going to drive you nuts. So I will stop now. <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, you know, it seems like every time we start talking about laptops, and especially gaming laptops, when you're talking about trade-offs, I don't think anything is perfect that's out there, but you, you've talked about some pretty major pain points, at least for me, with like trackpad not being great. And yeah. here's the thing, like trackpads these days are essentially smartphone displays or they can be they're digitizers and if if it's a really uh sensitive high dpi solution you can have a great trackpad experience whether it's made out of glass or not i know apple you know they're well known for using their glass trackpad displays that are as large as their largest phone but i, I i'm currently using a laptop it's an acer and it's it's fine i mean it, it gets decent Battery life is just kind of one of your typical sort of thin and light. It also has the MX150 graphics. But it, and even though the keyboard is fine, the keyboard actually has a decent typing feel and the construction is okay. Though it's mostly plastic. I, I just, the trackpad drives me nuts because there's like <laughs> resistance to finger movement and it's not completely accurate. And especially when I punish myself by trying to edit a photo or doing any kind of cropping or anything on an image with the trackpad and I'm completely missing the mark and having to undo and start over again. So uh, the worst thing on some of these trackpads that I've used is trying to select text. You know how you can do like, right. you can do a press and then drag to like select the line of text and I'm missing the mark and I'm selecting the wrong word and I'm going two or three letters into the next word and I just, I want to throw the thing out the window, but you know, if you're at a table, I just plug in a mouse <laughs> I just think there's gotta be. Why is it? I know that laptop is right. low margin. And I know that they're looking for ways to make money, but I mean, I I, I almost think answer. at this point I would take uh like reduced color gamut display or some kind of display mitigation to have a better trackpad because I don't think, I think there is a. I, I gotta say I think in a lot of cases there is a lot of display mitigation because some of the, especially in the less expensive laptops. There are some real dogs uh, in terms of, of color fidelity uh, on the screens. I mean, some really painful stuff. But the, uh, you know, I, I think in some cases it's an afterthought or they it's it's just some place where they can cut money. Um, I, I just want to you know make sure my issue with the um, 
my issue with the MateBook 13's trackpad, one, it felt a little cheap, you know, which is not a big deal. Uh, I've also been using a lot of flagship laptops, so I may be biased to a more luxurious feel. Uh, my biggest thing was in day-to-day use, it was fine, but with gaming, you had to be really particular about hammering you know, very, very far out to the left or right side of the trackpad to get your gaming on. So maybe the, the, the issue is me not using a mouse for gaming uh, and trying to use a trackpad. Um, it did feel cheap, but I'm, it was accurate. I didn't have trouble editing. I didn't have trouble, you know, dealing with, with, you know, basic functionality on the trackpad, but it was not the most luxurious, uh, uh, feeling trackpad. It just, it felt a little, you know, when you press on something and you're like, well, that's certainly a thing. <laughs> this is not the stylish You're talking thing luxurious, and I'm thinking, thing. is this like a leather-covered trackpad? Maybe that's maybe that could be a thing. Forget glass. I, Just go to like Corinthian leather. Fine Corinthian leather from Cordoba. Um, no, you know it's it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I think for most people, something like the basic MateBook Pro that has the doesn't have the three by two monitor would be a better choice. I think it's also tough because. Uh, you know, what, something I didn't do was experiment with, with running sort of 10, it's, I digress. The MX150, uh, you know, is barely a GPU by concern, uh, discrete GPU by current standards. Um, but it's one of the only parts you can fit in something this small, uh, and actually have the thing function and not light your lap on fire. So I, you know, I, I it was cool to be able to play, you know, rocket league on something that small and that, you know, fit in my backpack without causing, uh, spinal damage. So I'll just leave it at that. But I'm, I'm with you, dude. Um, I was going to say, cheap, you know what? That was almost a great segue because I could have said, but you know, it's not small. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen pictures of the massive new King of the Hill Xeon workstation processor. Three it's, it's not small. It's, it, but yeah, the price tag isn't small. It's physically a large chip. I don't, I don't think it's quite, quite as big as a Threadripper. I have not had one in my hands yet, but I, I had been looking at the day one reviews posted yesterday at, at outlets like Gamers Nexus and Steve over there published a review and going through the charts here and looking at performance with this thing. Just so you know, this mm-hmm. is a 28 core. So 56 thread. Uh, processor with the, the TDP to give you an idea of what kind of performance they're pushing out of this thing is 255 watts. And it it can turbo up to 4.3 gigahertz. And this is an unlocked processor too. So just imagine what kind of uh, cooling solution. Well, there's actually a custom cooling solution they developed with uh, Ace Attack that's available. But the, the performance of this thing, and I'm thinking, okay, 28 watts or 28 cores excuse me uh well we already have like a 32 core thread ripper so how can this compare well we're looking at things that are you know more single thread optimized and especially adobe uh creative suite like if you look at adobe like premiere pro cc 2019 Mm -hmm. he has a benchmark here and it's very impressive performance. We're talking about double the performance, like half the rendering time compared to that threader for the 2990WX. So even with that price tag, even with the, you know, it's just kind of ridiculous specs and everything else that goes along with this. And I'm sure the total cost of ownership of this is not going to be low because this is only being offered currently to system integrators. So this is going to be like, you'll, you'll find it, from places that are offering pre-built high-end workstations. But right. to get this level of performance, especially if you live inside of Adobe CC, if you dependent dependent on workload, of course, because there are certain workloads where you just want more cores, and that's where Threadripper has a huge advantage because we're talking like the high-end Threadripper part is only like $1,729 when I looked last night on Amazon. So, you know, this, uh, that's, this is almost twice as much money and we don't even know what motherboard pricing will be like. And there's only one cooler so far that's even designed to work with this new uh, platform, which it itself is $400 at retail. So this is not cheap, but it, it really comes right. down to like how much, how valuable is your time? And if the workload makes sense, then this starts to look really attractive. 
I know that Steve over at Gamers Nexus, his conclusion kind of ended with, uh, if he can find the budget for it, he wants one of these for their work because of what it would do to speed up their rendering times and that sort of thing. So it's just a big, you know, extreme high performance monstrosity of a workstation processor. And I just, I find this kind of stuff fascinating. Like I, where some people might be like turned off by like the TDP. I'm just like, whoa, 255 watts from a CPU. That's like, that's like a GPU. <laughs> Imagine the coolers. I know the cooler is really impressive. Uh, I did a news post for this last night, but I, I was looking at the Ace Tech website, and that is a thick uh, radiator. I don't think I've ever seen a bigger one outside of like a you know a vehicle. But although you know you could because probably we've gone down that road before in the past. I'm sure you know car radiators. I, I used a car radiator attached to a <laughs> liquid cooler. Um, it was very stable. <laughs> and if you if you you buy one with an integrated electric fan and you run the electric fan at five volts off the power supply, uh, it runs slowly enough that it doesn't drive everybody in the room with you insane, uh, which was the big kind of takeaway from that build. But, you know, if you put several gallons of liquid uh, at the time, I don't remember the exact wattage of the processor in question, but it was like around the Core i7-920 era. Um, so 150 watts is not out of the question, but uh, the uh, you know it turns out if you have a lot of water, it's much easier to keep your CPU cool. <laughs> that's that's the big thing too. Like forget about you know there's a lot of like the the fan size the size of the radiator really a lot a lot of these closed loop uh, all in one solutions and I've tested quite a few of them over the last few years. That's really the thing. Like you don't have very much liquid. It's a very small loop, and some of these are even smaller than others. Like the the smaller form yeah. factor solutions that just don't have any cable length. They're, they're, and they have a smaller radiator, even, especially like a 120 or even 240. At some point, you reach this this temperature to the liquid itself. It can no longer be effectively cooled going through the radiator, and then you're in trouble. So this this clearly has the capacity to cool i mean the cooler itself can handle 500 watts so there there's some headroom there for some overclocking if you fancy overclocking your three thousand dollar workstation processor and by the way the three thousand dollar price tag is if you buy a thousand units so who knows what it would be if it was offered to the public i would assume probably a little north of several that. dollars more. yeah just a few dollars more wasn't that a movie this episode of this week in computer hardware brought to you by hover building your online brand never been more important buying a domain name for your passion the first and biggest step to building your personal brand online websites are awesome they don't get squirrely the way certain social media sites do you don't want to be tied into somebody else's platform you want to keep your domain name clean and awesome you want to you want to keep it separate from your hosting it gives you flexibility to choose the right platform for your business you don't want to be stuck with a solution that doesn't meet your needs and you know what? You need a domain name. If you don't have a domain name, stop. Everybody has one these days. It's useful. It's something that's not tied into somebody else's platform, which is incredibly important. And if you take a look at Hover, they've got over 400 domain extensions to choose from. One we really like lately it's, that's come out, it's brand new, the .me TLD, the top-level domain, .me I just like the way that sounds. It's a unique extension to use for your portfolio to showcase who you are and what you do. If you've got a portfolio website ready to launch, get the .me extension. Kids, it's better than the Instagram, I'm telling you. Hubber offers best-in-class customer support team, no upsells, clean and simple user experience and interface, personalized email that matches your domain to further support your online identity because it's just awkward to use a, well, a, 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 you know, that big company account when you could be using at your domain name dot me. So if you haven't heard about it, Hover Connect, it's a nice feature that lets you connect your domain name to a lot of website builders with just a few simple clicks. Check it out, people. They do good stuff. This year, find a domain name for your passion. Visit hover.com slash twit to get 10% off your first purchase of any domain extension for the entire first year. That's hover.com slash twit for 10% off your domain extension for a full year. We want to thank Hover for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. I love domain names. They make me happy. 
Are you one of those people who registers domain names when you think of like a cool title or something that you just you want to have ownership of and you pay probably annual fees right and left for domains? I or? did, but then I started realizing how much I was paying for website domain names that I was never yeah. using. And, and, you know, the one I wish I still had was riotcontrol.com. <laughs> <laughs> That's not bad. Nope. Yeah, I've, I've let everything that I own lapse as well. So now everybody can make all the millions I didn't make with the ideas that I had when I was, you know, <laughs> 22 years old. I hate it when that happens. Something we were talking about recently, uh, Meizu's Zero, the world's first holeless phone. And uh, if oh you're watching on the video gosh, at home, yes. you're looking at the Indiegogo campaign. So three-dimensional ceramic unibody design, super m charge wireless, high-speed wireless data transmission, and, uh, well, practically holeless. My understanding was there was, there was a reset button uh, and a mic, or a reset button hole and a mic button hole. Um, so the, the screen is the speaker. There's an underscreen fingerprint sensor, uh, eSIM and IP68 certified, and uh, certified, certified. Um, the Meizu Zero is ready to embark on a remarkable mobile phone adventure. So <laughs> that makes me giggle. Um, yeah, so does the holeless term. I'm just staring at this like, this is really, this is really their advertising. Okay, this is, <laughs> I mean, we, we're used to phones that don't have a headphone jack now for the last couple of years, unfortunately. But, you know, the punch outs, like what we've seen from leaks about the new Galaxy S10 right. that's coming. Uh, you know, I mean, it. Who needs buttons? Who needs anything? You know, who even needs a display? <laughs> All we need is an Amazon Web Services enabled device that's uh, just attached to our brain and, and responds to our thoughts. I guess. Well, I thought it was it was interesting. Uh, you know, you can transfer files at high speed with our wireless charging base, which includes a USB C output cable, uh, or you can transfer data via Bluetooth. <laughs> um. You know, not a lot of, I, 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 I got to say, there's a lot of marketing excitement and not a lot of specs um, for a phone that's, that, uh, uh, that they're listing for $1,300. So the uh, exclusive engineer unit priced out at $1,299, April, April 2019 delivery, 16 out of 100 claimed. And they have sold out of the single exclusive pioneering unit that is uh, estimated to be delivered January 2019. Uh, that has been sold uh, for a healthy $2,999. So they made a I fat see things lot like of this, money. And not only do I just immediately and very pessimistically pronounce them DOA in my head, uh, but then I wonder, like, who is it that is buying these? Maybe they're collectors of obscure phones which you know i mean i i or may or may not have a new inbox hp pre-3 but that's another story entirely <laughs> i want to see who bought the three thousand dollar phone because you always forget oh wait hold on there's anonymous oh where is it where is it ben sin spent three grand for the phone he's Sounds very like excited you know a lot of names out there. It's a big world. A lot of names just sound unfamiliar. Uh, Cooler Master SK630 Low Profile Mechanical Gaming Keyboard. You guys uh, did a write-up on this one. Um, it's cool to see these keys because they are using uh, the Low Profile MX keys. I, did a, a, I had a look at their keys, uh, or these keys, in one of the uh, Cherry keyboards, which was a peculiar experience because they were keys we associate with very stylish and expensive keyboards that were in a very inexpensive looking but still fairly expensive uh keyboard from cherry um the uh christopher coke growth is up for for pc per how did he yeah. feel about the low profile keys people seem to either love them or kind of be weirded out by them he okay he came from experience with the cherry ml keys mm -hmm. and he was not a fan to say the least and he absolutely loved these in comparison. So he, his issue with this keyboard, if he had one, was actually the spacing of the keys, which it's kind of hard to see in the photos. But he said he was very specific about it. He's like, no, these are twice as close together as I'm used to. And he measured and he's like, yeah, it's like 50 percent less of a gap between these keys. So he kept on 
when he first started using it, like his first few hours with it, he was like accidentally striking other keys, but he adjusted. He didn't have a problem adjusting to the low profile. And it's just one of those things like it's 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 a very different kind of style if you're used to what we would think of as a like a modern mechanical keyboard, which are a little bit higher. The keys sit higher. The keys usually have sort of a concave uh, like layout on the actual board. These are totally flat. They're uh, flat with the surface uh, of the aluminum beneath the actual top layer. And this is sort of a wedge shape, kind of like an Apple keyboard. He actually made a couple of comparisons to Apple. You know, their 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 wireless keyboards sort of famously have a slight wedge shape to them, like a aluminum on top, plastic on the bottom. That's what this is. And just with deeper keys, but they're still flat, sort of chiclet style, but thicker, very, very slightly concave at the top. So if if you if you like Apple style keyboards, this is like a almost like a bigger mechanical version of that more than it is related directly to any currently available mechanical keyboards that you may have tried. But then you're getting that mechanical switching. So he was a fan of the feel and he was actually impressed with the keyboard overall. But it's it's like so many things we talk about, like you have to try it because this is like a, a set design. There, there are no flip out feet to change the angle. It is what it is. And if you have a problem with the key spacing or something and you can't get adjusted to it, this might not be the keyboard for you. But it's it's kind of the first in a new line of Cooler Master products that we've seen. We have some more stuff on the way. And they have like a whole new line of keyboards this year. But this was interesting, uh, to say the least. And sounds like obviously the, uh, the key switches themselves kind of stole the show like he he just couldn't stop raving about these new low profile tray mx switches so good to know it is uh i don't know it's always it occurs me how personal keyboards can be for people (laughs) yeah i mean it's how you're directly (laughs) interfacing with your computer the most especially if you write you know for, for editing and things you're using the mouse just as much very often but Depending, I mean, depending on what you're doing, I do a lot of uh, Lightroom, but I feel like I'm using the mouse and keyboard equally. Mm-hmm. But you know, he he loved it for gaming. He said it was great for gaming. He, uh, but for typing, you will notice it's a little bit kind of smaller feeling. I'm always amazed by custom keycaps that are set up for gaming that make a laptop or excuse me a desktop almost or a keyboard desktop keyboard almost impossible to use for normal, uh, you know, typing. <laughs> You don't like that lightning fast actuation? The lightning and, fast actuation uh, wasn't the problem. These were actual physical key covers that were designed oh, to sort of gotcha. yes, fingers, yes. you know, not slip off of, of the, you know, the AWSD keys. Um, but they made it almost impossible to reach like the Q and the E, um, amongst other things. That was always a real peculiar experience for me. The uh, uh, You guys, uh, Lee Garbett, still cranking out power supply reviews for you guys. Um, was the Corsair, this is the SFX. Is that the little tiny platinum power supply that they announced? This thing, I, I cannot get used to these. I am, I am so obsessed with these. Not that I need one, not that I have anything, you know, my, I, I'm pretty good on power supplies, but I was cradling this thing. It's like, you know, the size (laughs) of a couple decks of cards. It seems like it's not quite that small. Yeah. And this is this but is the standard SFX too. Like there's SFX yeah. L. You see a lot of those especially at, at higher uh like power ratings. Mm-hmm. You, we've seen 750 watts before, I think, but it was an SFX L. You may have even seen 800 watts from SFX L. But if you're looking at the get, video right now, it's yeah. tiny. It's the one on the left. <laughs> yeah. It's it's it makes an SFX L almost look big and it's way less than half the size of an ATX power supply even a smaller one and this will mm-hmm. fit in almost anything there are, there are small mini ITX enclosures that allow you to go up to SFXL but then sometimes depending on the build you run into issues with like you know having enough room for your modular connectors and that sort of thing so it but I have never seen we've never seen in the industry a power supply this dense 750 watts in something this size is just crazy to me and yeah. it's not just that it's powerful it's extremely efficient this is a platinum rated power supply 
And Lee, if you read the review, he goes through on the test bench uh, and he tests everything, tests and load regulation, you know, AC ripple and efficiency and all that. And it, it passes everything and does extremely well. This is coming with a set of Corsair's nice, like sleeved, uh, shorter cables for that small enclosure. And it's not inexpensive. This is a new line that ra- ranges from 119 to $179, depending on the uh, the model, with this 750 being the high-end model. But if, you, if you're looking at like the absolute most you can cram into the tiniest enclosure possible, this is about as good as you can do right now. And and I, it made me think about, okay, well, what, what case do I have that actually requires a power supply like this? And I don't actually have any here. One of the first cases I ever reviewed was the N case M1, that crowdfunded case that was just the size of a shoebox, basically. And more recently, I, I did the Dan cases case. That's, again, like shoebox size, even smaller than the M1. And with the N case, you could actually use a uh, ATX power supply if you really wanted to, even though you, you you lost a lot of volume inside the case by doing that and had fewer options with your build. But the Dan cases, you pretty much have to use SFX. And if you use SFX L, you, again, are losing space. So this is just one of those things where if, if you're into the really tiny mini ITX builds, but you want to use things like, uh, you know, you can buy a mini ITX board for Ryzen. I actually have, right. I have one of those right here. You get yourself a, a mini ITX board, put your put your like eight core CPU in there, and you want to run the latest you know high power GPU like a twenty eighty Ti. You can do it if you have a power. I, I have one of those, but it's at the other end of the house. <laughs> 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 I don't want to disappear and not come back. But it's I mean it's incredible how dense i mean you know because i've got you know a machine that's this big that i'm putting an 1800x into or an enclosure it's incredible how dense you can get at this point in terms of power supplies motherboards computing power um that's pretty awesome yeah so. it's a nice clean layout inside too i was looking at the uh the tear down photos that lee always does and it's like that's a very clean looking little power supply in there i was expecting it to be a little bit more like disorganized i guess <laughs> for its size, but not really. Oh my goodness! Uh, Gold Award, um, not the cheapest 750 watt power supply. Yeah, but that's really the seven- only drawback. But at this point, you don't really have any other options, so it's true. I mean, if you want at least well rated 750. <laughs> yeah, well, it, I guess it's like the SF 450 is 120 bucks. The 600 is 149 bucks. The 750 is 180 bucks, and it's amazing. Uh, you know, do the math on on your GPU and and your CPU before you commit to a large power supply because you may not need the power supply you think you need. Uh, which is practically a segue into that hard OCP review I saw when they were looking at the. Uh, I, I think half the reason I wanted to talk about this is because uh, anytime you have a power supply named after Thor. It just screams excitement to me. Uh, so well, Asus anytime you have back- a power supply that has its own OLED display on it. I mean, come on. Well, yeah. That's the selling point right there. Right. <laughs> 1,200. The Asus ROG Thor 1,200 watt power supply uh, reviews up on hard OCP. Um, <laughs> it promises you to... Harness thunder and, and ride the uh, lightning. So the marketing has been hot and heavy. Um you know, so R-Sync RGB illumination, integrated OLED. Oh, it's an OLED information panel. Oh, yes. um, so, you, oh, yes. so you have a unique customization and monitoring options for your ROG gaming rig. Um, high quality capacitors, a fat 135 millimeter wing blade fan, large heat sinks, a Lambda A plus and 80 plus platinum certifications. So, uh, you know, the, uh, the crew at Hard OCP did their usual abuse uh, which I will affectionately call testing, and uh, it passed. Silver Award. Um, you know, $319 with prime shipping. Uh, that is a really expensive 1,200-watt. It's a really expensive power supply even for a 1,200-watt power supply. So, yeah. yes. um, you know, you you are paying for the OLED display. and the, you know, and we, the... Saw it, we saw it in person at CES <laughs> when I was at Asus, and it 
it's really cool, but I mean, uh, it's really up to you. If you if you are building one of those like dream builds, and you just like for some reason you've got like you know thousands of dollars, and it's like every PC enthusiast dream. Like somebody gives you like five grand, like buy whatever you want. <laughs> I mean, once you've bought your you know multiple high end GPUs and your crazy you know twenty eight core processor, if you have any money left. This would look really cool in one of those tempered glass side panel cases where you can see the power supply. And not every case shows off the power supply, but you'd better believe that Asus was using a case that did at CES. You could <laughs> Home and hope. Like real time monitoring uh, what the power supply was actually putting out, which was, you know, it's cool. But it's just one of those sort of fun excess, sort of uh, a celebration of excess, I guess. There's nothing wrong with a, a little excess now and again. Oh, my goodness. Speaking of success, not excess, uh, it's time for our yearly Twitch survey. We want to hear from you so we can serve you better. That's the success we're looking for. Head over to twit.to slash survey19 and be heard. Help guide the future of the Twit network. Uh, and let us know who you are so we can give you what you need and probably also so advertisers can target you with things you're actually interested in. Helps everyone that way. Oh, goodness. We should probably bring this one to a close because I suspect you're benchmarking something in the background and I'm convinced my children are lighting a small fire in the kitchen right now. So, uh, Those let's are never good noises listen. when you hear the strange noises from the kids in the other room. <gasps> yeah, what is that? Yeah. Is that my hole saw? <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's a really bad sound. Electric so power the, tools. Uh, it's uh, As they get older, it, it becomes less terrifying. But in the early years... How did he get that down out of the closet? He plugged it in. He's not bleeding. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, uh, funny story involving a neighbor and a power tool. Um, oh, my goodness. You've been listening to Twit this week. Twit's Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, the weekly show that covers all the hardware, mobile, desktop, laptop, gaming, consoles, the Internet of Stuff. We're kind of curious about it all, and we try to get you good information that will help you make a smart decision when you're buying and, of course, to help you keep your gear running for as long as possible. I'm Patrick Norton. You can find me over at techthing.com, T-E-K-T-H-I-N-G.com, or avxcel.com, which is a home theater and audio podcast. And, by the way, if you haven't been there, pcper.com is the place where the benchmarking gets done in volume and intensity. pcper.com is, of course, Sebastian's place of business. That's right. Which almost sounded like business, but uh, I mutilated a few consonants there. PCPer.com is a good place to go. If you haven't been there, go check it out. And uh, again, you've been listening to This Week in Computer Hardware. Twit.tv slash Twitch is where you can find all of our older episodes and the RSS feeds or feeds for iTunes or pretty much anything under the planet you want to subscribe to, whether you're looking for video or audio. You can get it there along with more information. That is Twit.tv slash Twitch. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Sebastian Peake. We'll see you next week on Twitch. Twitch.